Here's a question. Which one would you choose and why? Let, and maybe I should have said, which chicken sandwich are you choosing and why? And I don't. I, I honestly want you to think about your reasons and I want you to be honest with your reasons. There's not a reason that's too nuanced, too polarizing, to anything. I am curious though, how did you decide between Popeye's and Chick-fil-A? And for those of you who may not know, that American brands, um, I'm assuming these are international, but I don't know. Both chicken places, <laughs> Popeye's, uh, known for their, more so their whole chicken pieces, whereas Chick-fil-A will say they are the originators of the chicken sandwich. You know, who knows? I don't know. Um, but they got into it over the um, pandemic. I I thoroughly enjoyed the Twitter beef. I did. I was like, oh, restaurants are beefing on Twitter. Who knew? <laughs> But I love it. Whoever is doing Popeye's, um, their Twitter, good job on them. I love a good marketing situation. But here's some questions in case you need some prompts. Some you don't have to answer these. I'm just I put them here to to jog some 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 thoughts. Why would you choose either option? Like, what are the reasons that come to you, or neither option? How would you rate the value of the food? Do you consider it to be food, number one? And if you do consider either of these options to be food, how do you rate the value of it? How do you determine the value of it? What do you value about the company and the brand, if anything, right? I talked about, is it real food? Do you consider it junk food? Do you consider it healthy options? How does a type of food influence your decision? Meaning like fast food versus, um, you know, Chick-fil-A, you know, they be charging you $20 for a handful of kale soaked in oil, talking about it's a healthy salad. You know, they do got fruit cups, though, or bowls. Who knows? Do you prefer drive through or dine-in? I Me, mean, personally, I love to sit down. I don't understand why we would go home to put the food in the microwave, because I'm like, the microwave isn't all that healthy. I just rather enjoy my food, no matter where I'm at there. And how may others view your decision one over the other? Okay. Um, uh, love me chicken and pie pies. I don't look like Chick-fil-A because I find it to be a soggy sandwich that they have there. <laughs> it is a little soggy to bread every time. I feel like it's, but that's the appeal of why people love it. I just, I'm having flashbacks to being a hall director. Y'all, what we used to do is we used to go to the local Chick-fil-A and say, we need $500 worth of chicken biscuits and we need them to be ready at midnight to 1 a.m. And because all the bars close at two, as the freshman students were coming back, hear what I'm saying, as the freshman students were returning back to the residence hall, we would hand them a chicken biscuit so that they can have something to soak up their alcohol. And, you know, the school I worked at, the police actually drove them from the bars to their residence hall and little golf carts. Um, it was one of a kind of experience. If you're curious what the institution was, it was Georgia College. Um, while it is a public institution, it is does not operate as one. And it kind of operates as a private institution. But I digress. If you ever have any questions of what it's like to work there, you, you ask away. Um, but anything you would add to that, Danielle, in terms of <laughs> your reasoning? Oh, you also said because of... Um, I don't subscribe to Chick-fil-A hating on people. Anything else you would like to add to your reasoning? Um, I also think it's a whole scam for why they had closed on Sundays. Uh, <laughs> I'm convinced that they close on Sundays just to drive demand on Mondays. <laughs> you know, that good old interest conversions. We mm -hmm. don't say this is our Christian values. That's the why we are not open. Never mind that you do make more money because you are closed on Sundays. But you know. Tomato, tomato is what I say. <laughs> and I just, you know, I don't like the thought of claiming to be Christian and then hating on people. You know, <clears throat> but also <throat> some Southern values. <laughs> um, let me tell you, Brandon, okay, it's earlier before, this is what took me out. Now I've been adulting and doing things all day. And I was like, I'm gonna go to Popeye's because who has time to figure out what to eat? I was in line for 45 minutes. And the only reason why I didn't get out the line is because that would have meant I would have had to make another decision about where to go. And I was already committed, but I was irritated. 
it did take away from the taste of the chicken, but it's just fine. <laughs> so, and why do you say when they have food? Listen, I think that's what happened. I think they were completely ran out of chicken and they had to make more chicken, but they could have just communicated that. Oh, no, no, they can't do that. Hmm. I will uh, say in general, though, when they started this whole chicken sandwich at Popeye's thing, I was going to school in New Jersey and a poor soul lost their life over this chicken sandwich. No chicken sandwich is worth anybody's life. Especially that one. Because I'm not going to even hold you. I don't really think it's that good. But no. I, I just think people needed a way to channel their aggression throughout the pandemic. And the chicken sandwich happened to be it. So I'm with you. It, it ain't that good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that you're catching on, Danielle. Uh <laughs> Yeah, listen, no one is really going. I, I just, I find it hard to believe that anyone is going to Chick-fil-A for the taste of the food more than they're going for the service or the brand it's of it great. all. Like, I just, I mean, maybe, maybe the chicken nuggets or I don't know, maybe the sweet tea. I'm not really sure. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they the little chicken biscuits are about this big. That's what you were giving to the little children. Oh, those are chicken minis. No, it's oh. like the chicken biscuit, like the mm. full size biscuit with chicken okay. minis. I'm yeah. like, they need probably like 400 of those to sop up. Oh. <laughs> we would just have big old boxes and just give it to them. And while it is smart, I just used to be like, it's this what message are we sending that we are supporting them to go out and drinking? And I and I guess they didn't really cause too much trouble, but still. <laughs> just was like they're 18. I don't think their parents dropped them off to be like, yes, please feed them as they drink their brain cells away. Okay, I'm back. All right, so. Please continue to think about your reasons in this example. If you don't care, you don't care, you know, because that's an option too. You're like, I don't eat at either one of them. That's fine. But here's the thing. Self-awareness is key in research and life. Knowing why and how you make a decision is important, especially in research, which is why I started off with a very, I guess, fun <laughs> example <laughs> to take it out of the research realm to help you to see like, Knowing what is guiding your decision making will help you to realize like not everyone makes the same type of decisions or it has the same process. Like my mama say, all sense ain't common. And it's no thing that's no such thing as common sense because you know, because it's based on your environment, your context, right? Like who are you around on a daily basis? What media are you consuming on a daily basis? What's the culture of your program? What are the values and expectations of your committee, your faculty? What research are you constantly engaged in and reading and consuming? What are the conversations? What TV are you watching? What music do you listen to? Wait, am I breaking up, y'all? Right. All these things impact how you understand the world. We mostly think we have a lot of control over how we think. And in a way we do, but not in a way that most people think about that. Most people think that they are great. Like we're great at filtering out information. <laughs> you do not know how the brain works then. Um, I think it was Mimi, we were talking about this, how um, I was like, oh, it makes sense why you chose the research that you chose because your unconscious brain makes decisions for you all the time. You have no idea. You just think you're over here. Like, look at me. I made a decision to go eat at Popeye's or Chick-fil-A. Never mind that I've been seeing a commercial on repeat and I sleep with my TV on. So who knows how many times I watched that commercial. So of course, when I got hungry, my unconscious brain went for the easier option. Like, girl, we go to Popeye's. The jingle playing in the head and everything. Because that's how your brain works. Before I go into all the technical things, the whole point of paradigms or even knowing about your philosophy is when you can pay attention to what's surrounding you what was told to you over and over what you consume you will have a better idea of what it is that you value what is what is influencing your decision making and for a lot of you especially with the dissertation being your first time doing a research project from start to finish you're going to notice how much you have been influenced by your program and how they taught you research. And this is usually why when it comes down to talking to your chair, your committee about, oh, these are the type of methods I want to use, why you don't see eye to eye, because y'all are coming at it with two different worldviews, but we'll get more into that. A paradigm 
Mm, but Mimi, oh, this is so great. Okay, let me say it another way. You will understand just how how post positivist your program is. Even if they say they're social justice and they care about all the things, when we get into choosing research, that's when you will it be very clear like what the real values of the program are. And I can nerd out with you at the end if you're still here in terms of, because I'm trying to save my rents to the end. Um, I'm going to say this really quickly. And then I swear I'm going to get back on the thing. So I have a writing group with my um, friends that we all graduated from Georgia together. And we spend the first 30 minutes just venting. I'm like, y'all yeah, try really hard not to be the elitist PhD person who's like, I don't understand. People don't understand the technical things of the research. I try really hard because I'm like, not everyone is getting a PhD. Not everyone cares about research in this way. And not everyone, not every program had a strong qual department. But yeah, sometimes I see things and I'm like, what are these people teaching in the world? So an example would be, um, I had a call I think a couple of days ago, and someone was like, oh, I'm using this particular, I wanted to use this methodology, but my program told me it wasn't a real methodology, so I couldn't use it. And it was sister circle methodology. And I was like, why did they say it wasn't real? <laughs> and usually the reason why people would say it was like, because there's no difference between that and a focus group. And then that's always my first key to know, like, oh, you don't understand theory, right? But I don't want to be too elitist to the person because they didn't they didn't call me for that. That we were trying to we were talking about their dissertation. But tonight, y'all, if you want me to get in my elitist bag, I will because this is my jam. Theory and research is my jam. Like people can say they can mess with me in other places, not here. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Okay, a paradigm is a way of looking at the world. Pretty much it's the phil philosophy of research. It's like what are the assumptions guiding? your decisions as a researcher, essentially. Why are you making, when it comes to your dissertation, why are you making the decisions you're making? And it doesn't matter what the design is, if you're doing qual, quant, mixed methods, it doesn't matter, all things start here. Why are you making the decisions you're making all the way from the, how did you even get to your topic? For the, like how you consider the lens or the angle that you're taking with your topic. How did you get there? What's informing you there? Why, why are you, why do you even care about the topic? Why is it even worth the researching? These are the type of questions your paradigm will help answer. Good old Google and Lincoln. Listen, if you want to, you need any citation and qual, especially when you're talking about the notes and nuts and bolts of um, qualitative research, just look at, look, look them up. It's going to be a citation somewhere with their name on it. And most people, 99% of people are going to accept them because they're the goats. Now, I'm not saying I agree with every single thing. I'm just saying if you need a good, solid citation, these two, great citation. Let's talk about four basic belief systems. And if anything about a paradigm, you're going to hear these four words. Exology, ontology, epistemology, and methodology. Ology means, right, the theory of a thing. They do. That's why I said, they you know, like, but they will be accepted by most programs. So that's my frame of like, because again, that goes back to most programs of post-positivists, even though they don't think they are, right? <laughs> so XLHE asks like, what is it that you value? What's the nature of your ethics? And I'm going to use some regular words in a minute, but I just wanted to, I took this as a direct quote. So when you think about research in general, what do you consider to be ethical or moral? right? Because somebody thought it was ethical to tell a bunch of Black men in the South, like, hey, you want to go see the doctor for free? You should come over here. Yeah, no, no, never mind that we're going to inject you with syphilis and we because we're doing a secret project, but we will check your heart rate. We will give you some high blood pressure medicine. We will do that. A whole institutional review board agreed to that. Think about that. And when the people went back to them later and was like, so yeah, I don't think that was, that was the move. They were like, I mean, that's research though. We didn't do nothing wrong, which that's why no one got in trouble, really. I mean, it changed drastically later, years later, it changed how we approach research. But in the moment, they were like, we didn't do anything wrong. That racism had nothing to do with that. We were just doing good old research. Comes down to what they valued the research. They valued the data they were going to get. And they, a group of people made a decision that it would be best to not inform the participants that they were indeed participants, but instead tell them that they get to go to the doctor for free. Ontology, what is real? What is it? Like, how do you know if something is real? Um, I remember like, yeah, it was at the beginning of the pandemic when I first was teaching about this. And I was like, you know, cause words are data. 
And there was someone, a quad person who was like, words are data. That's not real, right? Her ontology would have said, yeah, words don't count. If it's not a number, if it's not a precise measurement, it's not real. So when you think about your research, what is real? Epistemology, what is knowledge? What's the nature of the knowledge? What's the relationship between you and the folks you're asking to be a part of the study? Do you have any rules around what it means to be a researcher, what it means to be a participant? Do you like the language of participant? These are all things your epistemology would help you answer. Once you have a good idea of those three, then it's, okay, methodology. So if we're saying this is what we value, if we're saying this is what's considered real data, if we're saying this is how we should govern ourselves and research, then what would be the best way to go about a, a, a collecting data? How do you capture? From what sources do you capture them for, from? That's what your methodology tells you. So here's my mini rant. This is why if you ever ask me about your chapter, your methods chapter, I'm going to start with where's your methodology, especially for my qual people. Me personally, this is me personally. I do not agree that there is a general qualitative project. I, that's not a thing. That's not a methodology, not in my book. Because what does that mean? If you're using, even if you're using something like phenomenology or narrative inquiry, I'm going to ask you, but whose theory, whose philosophy of, the, of those methodologies are you using? There's different schools of thoughts because this is about how do you know the most appropriate ways to, like the most appropriate sources and ways to collect data without answering these questions. Most folks will go straight to, well, I want to do like this cool way of getting data, but have no justification as to why they're choosing that. I guess on the other end of this spectrum, you may have told your, you may have like submitted your methods chapter and you were like, oh, I'm going to do interviews. And you may have received the feedback of, but what is an interview and why is it appropriate? And you may have thought to yourself, well, that's a dumb question. Don't everyone use interviews? And the answer is no, no, not everyone uses it. Not every study calls for it, which is another reason why I don't like general qualitative research as a methodology, because it's just, they're like, we're just doing an interview. If I see that, I know that you come from a very post-positive program and I know it's quant heavy. And people like to say, no, 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 but all of my committee members do qual research. I'm like, no, they think they do qual research. See, and then I, now I'm rude, now I'm being rude because people are published and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I put this link here um, and when you download it, you should be able to click on it. If I did it right, fingers crossed. But I like their images that they use in this article. I was like, why would I recreate the wheel? And they have beautifully laid this out. All right, so this is another way of thinking about this, right? Exology, what do we value? I mean, do you value words? Do you value controlled environments? Do you value participants talking about their experience in their own words? What do you value? Ontology, what's out there to know? How do you like, like what captures your attention about what to study? I mean, because some people would say, and that's like, I guess a common question would be like, what does race have to do with this? We're talking about, I'm thinking about um, someone who was doing a, a project on mothers who had children diagnosed with autism, but they were doing black mothers. And they're like, what does race have to do with this? This is a medical diagnosis, right? Because to them, it's like, race doesn't have to, they're two different things. One's a social construct. The other is a capital T, like true diagnosis is scientific, is objective, epistemology what and how can we know about it so do we care about their experience if we do then how do we learn about their experience what are your rules or thoughts around how do you capture someone's experience methodology how do we go about acquiring the knowledge so ethnography narrative inquiry phenomenology case study action research there's so many but i'm just trying to go up some common ones grounded theory Methods. What are the procedures to acquire the knowledge? There's words, there's numbers, there's pictures, there's videos, there's sound. There's a lot of more depending on, again, this comes back to how do you see the world? How do you see communication? And where are the sources of data coming from? Is it coming from people? Is it coming from websites, social media, books? Where is it coming from? Yeah, I didn't see your comment, but yes. Right. 
So common paradigms, there are also as many paradigms as there are people too, because words mean different things to different people. I'm just going to go over common language that I see consistently across, but just know that this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, this is just to get the conversation going. So post-positivist, Black and white, there is one truth. Usually you're trying to see how was, how, what were the results or measurements at the beginning of the experiment and what were there at the end of the experiment to speak in a very generalized way constructivist it's like well th there's many truths i mean we gonna low we gonna say there's many truths but low-key we still believe that there's one big truth but like we could be more open that there are many different ways of looking at right we're more interested in how do people understand the truth but when we go to write up this research we're still going to compare how they understand it to the capital letter t truth Right, so there is still coming at it with this assumption that there is one way to see a thing, that we're trying to seek objective, neutral truth. Both of these still believe in objectivity and neutrality, but it's just at what level? Transformative or critical, depending on the language you like. Yeah, there are many truths. There's no big capital letter T true that that's only determined by those who have the most power, but it doesn't make it to be the all knowing truth. Things depend on, experience depends on the context. Context means oppression, history, politics, cultural norms, customs. And usually if you're doing a transformative critical project, you're like, it's not enough to just talk about a thing. It's not enough to just ask people about their experience and to dig out all of their deepest, darkest things. We got to do something. You're charged with doing something to change the system in some way, to change their experience in some way for the better. I feel like people miss this last part. You got to do something. It's not enough to just call out systems of oppression. Like, what are you doing through your research? Any questions or anything so far? Just for like very few, um, that's not even something I feel like is highly promoted in, in academia. It's We just get lost in trying to analyze all of these different yeah because i just feel like <laughs> okay ck you about to make you see how i'm working really hard okay i'm gonna say this and it's gonna be real it's gonna be a little bit yeah i have no filter okay since it's full moon i was like it's just things just pop out my mouth and what i'll say is most academics are only interested in hearing themselves talk most academics are only interested in pleasing other academics and in my mind like since this is conference season this is why i can't go to conferences this season because i'm like if we only make up two to three percent of the world, why are we spending so much time and energy and money just talking to only two percent of the world, even though we claim that we want to help all the people? But we only talking to each other in these words and and secret codes that only we understand in a halfway. I'm like, I don't even understand it. Like you used a lot of words and they sounded good coming out, but I don't know what they mean together. Could you say that like like explain it to me like I'm five, right? But then when you say something like that, people are like, oh. Oh, she, she must not know. And then I got to be elitist and say, no, I went to the University of Georgia. You will not <laughs> touch me. Like, no, you just don't know what you're talking about. And okay, again, side note, this people who use these big words, because I'm saying this for the folks who are going to conferences, don't get caught up in the hype. Even though you're reading these documents and they use all these like, and, da -da 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 and it sounds all poetic. The feedback they consistently receive, because as someone who reviews manuscripts often is like this is not clear the reader cannot follow you what are you saying explain it and it means that you the ways in which don't even get me started I, I just there's the whole things of phrase I just can't but it usually means that people don't understand what it is that they're trying to say and so to hide that they don't understand it or they don't understand it enough to explain it to someone else they use these million dollar words as my father would say to hide that and so you will always hear me say Nope. Say that sim in a simple way. Say it like you're talking to your grandma, because something that is clearly written is real. It will help people because you have to remember, like anyone can pick up your work because they're looking for an answer to a problem. And if they can't understand it, then how are they supposed to use it? Most of y'all are here. Right. And so if you're doing something to change it, but people can't understand your work, how is that helpful? And then a side note to the side note is, this is why I'm like, just write your dissertation and be done with it. Because most of the people you want to help change 
or do something or assist, they're not going to read your dissertation. They're going to listen to you give a talk somewhere. They're going to read an article. Why? Because it's shorter. It's more, it's more accessible. Your two, three, 400 page document is not accessible. But the more that you can get in practice of speaking in a conversational way that more people can understand, the more that your work can impact. Don't get caught up in the academic hype. Okay. And in the rant. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> Post positivist. Here's the thing. It's just, it's all about privacy. It's about informed consent, which we could say like across the board, that's, that's true, right? It's minimizing harm. Equal opportunity. I don't, I'm not going to, so this article, which I think I have the citation. If I don't, I'll go find it. But they talked about that justice and equal opportunity was here. And I was like, I believe that. I don't, I don't believe it. But I would say maybe they try to make sure that everything is equal across. Like every participant has a chance to either get the experiment. What's the word I'm looking for? That's not the word I'm looking for. Like the placebo or the, y'all help me with the other word. <laughs> Whatever that word. Is. Validity. Like, um, like I either get the thing or I don't get, or I get the placebo. What is an experiment? Oh, talking about random assignment. Yes. Like, so that's like equal opportunity. Like I have an equal opportunity to be in either group. Yeah. Um, but there's one reality. There's one truth that we're all working towards, right? Objectivity, neutrality is most important. And you're mostly going to see this in quant work. I'm not saying always, but mostly. And you will typically write in a third person, typically. Because you're supposed to take yourself out of the research, right? To make it even more neutral and objective. Constructivist sits in the middle. Remember, this is a spectrum, right? So this sits in the middle. I think about this like, I don't know, Libra comes to my mind. Because I think about balance. It's like, I'm not trying to get in the middle of it. I'm Switzerland. Maybe that's a better thing. Like, I'm just here to listen to all sides. Because the assumption here is everything is made up anyway. So it's just listening. But if you are a Western re researcher, you're like, yeah, but there is one right way to do it, though. You go to your participants and you say, I'm really interested in what you have to say, right? So folks were doing experiments and they were like, yes, the data is great. Numbers are great. But why? We want to know more about why people made the decisions that they made. We want to know what they were thinking about during the experiment. So things like phenomenology or case study or ethnography were born. Like open-ended questions were born to say like, why did people make the decisions they made in the experiment, right? We're still, this isn't because we're trying to change any system. We just want to know more information and not even going to use this information in a technical way, but it'll help inform the data. I'm, I'm trying to give you more of a historical understanding of how these things were developed. Because these are the older forms of qual research, that's why they're also the most popular still among faculty. So usually when you say, I want to do, depending on your program, usually when you say, I want to do a qual project, if they are going to reach for a methodology, they're going to say something like case study, phenomenology, ethnography, or if they get real fancy, when they think they're being real fancy, they say grounded theory. But if you think about, um, if you have any experience with these methodologies, if you, if you think about their processes, they're very, there's a lot of, there's a like procedural that you do it in a certain way and you work really hard to remove any subjectivity from these methodologies, if you understand them, right? It's the, there's a huge separation between you as a researcher and those involved as participants. And that's coming from the constructivist lens. There's a time and place for this. Even if you consider yourself to be more critical, you may choose to use this in certain circumstances. Like if you're just getting started with what's going to be like a 10-year project, you may start more in a constructivist lens just to get an idea of what exists already, just to explore the data. So I wanted, I wanted to name that while you may have a set way of thinking about the world, you may choose to adopt another way for a particular project. You may write this in first or third. I mostly see people still write in third person, depending on their culture of their program. So transformative. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great that y'all asked open-ended questions. That was great. And it's great that, you know, you invited people. But the issue is those, like, for most part, when people are using post-positivist or constructivist, when they write up their findings and, and discussion, it's still the researcher saying, but this is what the truth is, right? Think about phenomenology, because I'm going to pick on phenomenology a lot because that seems to be the go-to. 
the process, when you go to analyze, right, you go, you do go interview folks about their experience, but the whole bridling process is you saying, okay, this is what I think. Let me remove what I think from the data. Okay, this is what the participant said. Okay, let me strip away their subjectivity from what they said and get to the essence of the truth. And then I'm going to write up the truth. Does that make sense? Like you, you, the process phenomenology is meaning you're you're removing people's like what is the word I'm looking for? Their assumptions or their anything that might be clouding their judgment, their emotions. Like oh, that's only true for them, and you're they're trying to get to the assumptions. Essence. Wait, say that again. They're taken for granted assumptions. And I I need a, I want to write an updated um blog but I don't know any new rappers like that but I wrote an, <laughs> a, a, a blog post about phenomenology is Nicki Minaj and narrative inquiry is Cardi B because Nicki Minaj when she came out in two, 2007 2008 right the conversation was all about her technical skills mm-hmm. how good she was as a rapper the the body was a was an afterthought almost like it was more about the attention it was a gimmick but it wasn't it wasn't mainly if you were talking to folks who really love rap who really like argued about you know these are my top five rappers of all time and here's why because they're technical right you got to think around this is the time where Eminem and Jay-Z would have been at the top of people's list and Nas would have been at the top of people's list because of their technical skills like you could put I don't know about Sean, okay, but I'm going to just say it. We could put the three of them in a rap battle and they're going to be able to hold their own. Like they can come up with different flows and different techniques and metaphors and all of this, right? But by the time Cardi came onto the scene, well, nobody was really talking about her technical ability to rap. We were talking about like what happened on the episode of Love and Hip Hop or who she's with and oh, she got pregnant and oh, she like changed this. And we're more concerned about her body, about her, her, not her body, her life and her experience and feeling like we we have this parasocial relationship with her. It's not only until recently that we're like, Nikki, we know too much about your life and the things we know, we don't want to know. So if you could just keep that to yourself, girl, that'd be great. Right. But like there's two different brands. Phenomenology, folks will say, well, I chose that because I'm interested in the experience of my participants. All qualitative research is interested in the experience. It's about in which way are you interested? So I, I usually say phenomenology is if you want to define a thing, if you want a definition of this is what it means to be a fill in the blank. Narrative inquiry would be more of a I am interested in the participants' experience using their own words from their lens. You want a definition that you can apply generally to people who meet similar, the same characteristics? Or do you want to talk about this particular group in this particular setting at this particular place and time and how they think about their experience? That is how you know if you just you should choose one or the other. So Janelle, you can't now. This is where we get really like, some people do, are doing critical phenomenology. I argue that's because of circumstances. I argue that their program was like, we like phenomenology, so you got to make it work. And so sometimes you got to make things work, depending on your circumstances. If your chair wants you to use phenomenology, but you're like, I'm coming from a critical paradigm, then you're going to say something like a critical phenomenological study, right? But you got to be able to explain how that works. What I am talking about today, for most of you, your program won't even ask you this level of questioning. They don't even know enough to be able to ask you these questions. (laughs) So you don't need to offer it to them. You could just say, I'm doing a critical phenomenological study. I'm not even going to, I appreciate this breakdown because it's making me question I've chosen, I'm doing mixed methods and for the qualitative, I've chosen phenomenology. And for a hot, quick second, I was like, oh shit, do I need to do narrative inquiry? But no one has asked me to defend as yet to defend why I'm using this approach and how does it, no one's asked me about my paradigm either. So we're going to just kind of keep it moving until yeah. someone's asked. Yeah, we're going to save that in case you want to publish or you want to give a talk somewhere and then somebody might more likely or, or to ask you these questions. Mm-hmm. But most folks in programs don't know enough to ask you these questions. And listen, I can hold multiple things at the same time. You need to finish your degree. We don't need to try to like overhaul programs. Mm-mm. Focus your work on the people <laughs> who you are centering in your research. Don't get caught up in these programs. Let them be what they are. 
oppressive institutions of a, yeah, like we just gonna let them be. So if you're doing something more like transformative, critical, you're like, no, I'm with the people. I want to know how the people see it. I want to know how they make meaning of it because you value for you. That's real. You don't think it's just, oh, their judgment is cloudy. You're like, no, that's if they lived it, it is real. That's different than someone who's like, yeah, I value their experience, but I'm going to strip away their cloudy judgment and get to the truth of a thing. You're like, no, it's true because they lived it. If they said it, then it happened. <laughs> you definitely will be writing this in first person, which is a little strange when you're switching from probably how you were taught to write to this, to a critical way of writing. Because you are the research instrument and because it is very important, especially when you're using a critical paradigm to name this is what I'm doing and this is why. And these are some implications for the decisions I'm making. Because this paradigm also asks you to name the power dynamics inherent in research and what are you doing in your study to flatten those power dynamics. So an example would be, you may choose to go to the home of your participants because it's more comfortable for them, because it's safer for them. Or you may choose to pay everyone $300 for three hours of their time because you really you recognize that people may have to take off of work or they may need to get child care or they may need to do some additional things in order to participate in your study and you want to honor that and so to make it easier for them to make it more equitable for them to be in the study, you would provide financial financial resources. And it doesn't have to be financial resources, right? I'm thinking about for me in my dissertation, I made sure there was food, Publix to be exact, because my folks were the Publix, right? I was like, I don't, okay, Publix it is. If that's gonna make it more comfortable for you to eat, like you need to eat, right? Like uh, someone needed to bring their baby. She could sit right here. I got coloring books for her and I got toys for her. Why? Because I wanted to make it easier for her to be involved. Sometimes people had to be on Zoom because they couldn't make it in person because I wanted it still to be available for everyone. I was like, yeah, that counts. Now, somebody else may make a different decision because they might be like, well, that's not equal. Everyone needs to do the same thing. But you have to ask yourself, are you concerned about things being equal or equitable? That goes back to your paradigm. Do you call people participants? Do you call them co-researchers? co-conspirators what language choices are you using are you um maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later another example would be do you call them um what is the word limitations or do you call them boundaries of the study because words mean different things i know this is probably really nuanced and in the weeds for some of you but i would really want you to think about the word choice where are the words coming from you might say oh i'm using triangulation member checking. Why? Does that go with your paradigm? Is there another way of checking for rigor? Is rigor even a concern for you? All of these things matter according to your paradigm. But again, most programs are not going to ask you this. I am doing this so that you could be aware of it. Listen, the public sub always go down, okay? Always. And the chicken, depending on the Sunday and how I'm feeling. <laughs> but their cilantro jalapeno hummus is amazing. Y'all and their cakes, no one will beat them. Okay, this is just another way <laughs> of saying the difference between these three. Like post positivist is like we're we're trying to make things as generalizable as possible. Constructivist is like understand and describe. I'm not trying to be neutral, I'm just trying to understand and describe. Critical is like, yeah, we need to flatten power structures and help people have positive social change. Another way of figuring out what would be the appropriate paradigm. Your paradigm justifies your research decisions from your purpose, but from your problem, your purpose, your questions, if you have questions, your methodology, how you collect the data, how you analyze it, all of that goes back to how you see the world. It also explains why you keep having the same argument with your advisor, your committee, because they're most likely coming from a westernized, white center, individualized approach. You probably don't come from that approach, not from your culture, your community, right? Your background. Do you believe that you are all knowing? Because right now your program is teaching you to think of yourself as this wise, all knowing researcher with your fancy degree. Do you agree? Do you believe that? Another way of saying it is, do you think you're better than people because you have this degree? And how do you know what you're like, look at your actions and the decisions you're making in research to determine if, if you think you're better or not. So this is about being intentional. So I talked about all of this about 
your word choice, your goals, your relationship with folks, right? Um, I, I want to give another example of like relationship with the folks who participate in your study. So I wasn't the only one to analyze my data for my dissertation. What I did was, so we had a total of four sister circles. For the first three, I recorded them, right? I transcribed them. I did two rounds of coding or just like going through it. And then I went to them and I was like, all right, I did this a real quick and dirty, but this is what I came up with. Do y'all agree, disagree? Would you change anything? Is there anything you felt like I missed? And that conversation was the longest of the, the four conversations. I had to cut it off at like two and a half hours. But the level of depth and nuance we were able to get to, I wouldn't have been able to get to on my own. But because I was presenting the data to them, yes, that was still through my lens because I did a preliminary like analysis, but they were in all of the circles. So they were doc students who understood the research process. And I was just showing them like, this is what I found, but what what, are you, what, what is coming up for y'all? And because of that, we can have, there's 10 people looking at the data, thinking about the data, examining it and being like, here's what I think we should focus on. And so I just wrote that up. But that was, for me, that was part of my values of, I don't think I need to, I need to be the only one saying what's important. I wasn't the only person doing this. Even in how I, what I called myself, I, I too was a participant. There was no researcher. We were all a part of it. Like from the, from the, um, I just said, Hey, are y'all available on a Thursday at seven? I'm going to bring some publics. Here's where we're going to meet at. And at that first conversation, I was like, I'm going to get us started, but I have no idea where we're going. Can y'all tell me what our, the topics are going to be for our next sister circles? Can you tell me what you want to talk about? The way I wrote my RB was to say, I'm going to have to update this later when the people tell me, but I didn't make those decisions, right? And I didn't act as the researcher. I act maybe more as a facilitator. Like if there was, like if we got to a, a part of the conversation where we needed a different question, I would phrase a question, but I didn't have to do that really that much because everyone took ownership and was like, yeah, we're just having a conversation between 10 women, right? Now I realized there was a, a friend of mine who was also using sister circle methodology. She didn't feel comfortable being that loose with it. She was like, no, I'm going to have four circles. We're going to, we're going to talk about the same questions and I'm going to have people change out each circle. And I'm not going to include myself as a participant. Like she talked, but she didn't include herself in the data analysis. Whereas me, I'm, you see my quotes under my pseudonym in my dissertation. So I hope that is a helpful example. Okay, Danielle. Um, my question for you is like, did you call that member checking just because, you know, if you're taking the Lincoln and Guba approach to like member checking and adding what they call credibility to the analysis right they say member checking is when you send your transcripts to your participants and dialogue with them to make sure that their quotes are being representative of what they said mm -hmm. to accurately describe their understandings um is that also called member checking in this with this methodology or was it called something else i use what is called authentic data so that was the frame I use, which is also a video inside of, if you go into um, Kajabi, and maybe I need to do an updated one because that's from a few years ago. But yeah, I didn't use the language of member checking and I didn't give them their transcripts. I didn't give them quotes. I legit was like, okay, at the first conversation, we talked about the idea of a good girl versus the video vixen. And we watched all these things. Like I just did more of a recap of our circles. And then I was like, what is coming up for y'all? Like, it was just the simplest question. And so for me, that was just an extra circle. It wasn't that like, these were the quotes I pulled for you, or this is what I'm thinking about writing up for you. I just, was just summarizing it. Um, but I can go and grab that article for you too, if you're curious about what I used to say, um, to talk about, I guess, the value of the data. Yeah. Well, selfishly from my own comps question coming up, we have to talk about rigor markers and the debates about them. So I was just curious in terms of that. I'll so. go see if it's there. It should be there. Um, and I can pull that for you in a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I also thought this was a cool, I don't know if you can really see it, but I thought this was a cool graph. Um, so again, I will make sure that I update this because I don't even see the Zoom. Oh, here we go. So they're using different like um, 
like the different shapes to tell you which um, theory they're focusing on. But I just like how they broke this down. So me talking about phenomenology would be constructivist, right? This is when you get into more of like action resource, research, critical discourse analysis for critical, but these gives you examples. So I'll, that I hope that that is helpful for you all. And I think this is my last slide. So I was trying to give an example to make this clearer. Three different people can have the topic of doctoral program and student success, right? If you're post-positivist, you might be thinking about the factors that contribute to academic success. So you might be doing a pre and post or some sort of assessment of maybe of the program objectives or the course objective, or however you define academic success, whatever the variables that are connected there. But you're usually doing some comparison or something. And it's not always comparison, I realize. I'm just thinking of an example. Whereas if you're like, okay, I'm going to take more of a constructivist approach, you just may simply ask the students, what was their experience in the program? What was their experience of academic success in the program? And you may do interviews and focus groups because you're interested in their experience. And then you're going to make one definition, usually like one narrative of this is what it means to strive towards academic success in the doctoral program. You're writing one way, one frame of it, but it transformative. You might ask something, you may be focusing like, what are the culturally relevant advising strategies that contribute to student success? That's a whole different type of study, right? You might use interviews, drawings, pictures, just depends on what lens are you seeing doctoral programs and student success through. 